Now, historically, actually, varicosities have a little bit of an, an interesting background. Uh, it started in, from the Latin terminology for twisted and swollen vein, thanks, thanks to Hippocrates, approximately 2,500 years ago. Uh, we still see those terms today, and what better definition of a varicose vein than a twisted and swollen vascular system? Galen, who is well known in medical circles too, about 1,800 years ago, actually was recommended the first vein stripping when he said that these varicosities should just be torn out by the use of a sharp hook, which sounds somewhat brutal, but that's what a vein stripping is even today. Under, it's just done under more sterile surgical conditions. Agenita, about 1,500 years ago, actually described the ligation and excision of these varicose veins. Again, a direct surgical approach, somewhat more civilized than what Galen proposed with just a sharp hook. And it wasn't until about 500 years ago that Ambrose Paré actually noted the association of ulceration with these varicose veins and made that association of chronic venous changes associated with large varicosities. This is just an old European procedure called the Rindfleisch procedure uh, for treating lower leg varicose veins and basically just by making a corkscrew-like incision was able to exclude the varicose veins completely from the rest of the circulation, though obviously this, this left a large, very unsightly scar in treating this problem of primary varicose veins. We do a much better job with the various ablation techniques, be they radio frequency or laser ablation, and also some ultrasound guided sclerotherapy techniques with foam agents, which are used to ablate superficial varicosities as well. So again, a little bit more civilized treatment of the problem, but it does remain a significant problem uh, that we have to deal with. And you can see the difference between simple ablation of the great saphenous vein shown here, just at the site of the saphenofemoral junction at the level of the groin, versus this old procedure, as say, which left a rather nasty looking scar in the lower leg. The third consideration for chronic venous disease are those not primary but secondary varicose veins, particularly in patients who have what we call the post-thrombotic syndrome. They have had an episode of previous deep vein thrombosis and now the residual effects of that are felt either because there is chronic obstruction in the deep venous system or there is valvular incompetence because of the previous thrombosis in the deep venous system, or worst case scenario, both exist. It's a combination of insufficiency and obstruction. These are patients who very frequently have significant stasis changes and which oftentimes lead to ulceration in the lower leg. And this is that classic venous stasis ulcer. It's a very superficial type of ulceration. It's a very wet, weepy wound, very difficult to heal because of the chronic skin changes surrounding the site of ulceration that are frequently seen. And there's very poor circulation and oxygenation to the tissue at the site of a venous stasis ulcer, which makes healing of that wound a significant clinical challenge. The problem here again goes back to that we saw with the calf muscle pump. If you look at the function of the calf muscle pump in light of either, for example, a popliteal occlusion or combination occlusion and reflux flow, when the calf muscle contracts in the case of obstruction, the only source of emptying is out through the perforator veins into the superficial system. Both of these very quickly dilate and become incompetent, so the calf muscle contracts, you get venous emptying. When the calf muscle relaxes, you get venous refilling through the same route. So you end up basically with a to and fro flow from the calf and no significant venous emptying towards the heart. When in fact a patient ambulates and walks aggressively over a period of time, this actually will increase arterial inflow into the calf and you can see a small increase in ambulatory venous pressure in cases like this, not any decrease at all. So you would go from 100 millimeters mercury to 110 millimeters mercury when you're ambulating in a case like this, which will simply make matters worse as you've now increased the, the presence of venous hypertension in this particular system. When we talk then about the post-thrombotic patient, particularly or secondary venous insufficiency, obviously then the perforating veins become an important player. So we have to look at them very carefully as well when we're considering chronic venous insufficiency. 
The primary perforating veins of interest are the so-called cockets group, which are just above the medial malleolus in the lower leg in that so-called gator zone in the lower leg. Important perforators also are Boyd's perforator in the upper calf and Dodd's perforator at approximately the level of the adductor hiatus in the lower medial thigh. But hemodynamically, typically the important perforator veins are the cockets perforators as their is where you will see the chronic venous changes and potential ulceration. Dr. Cockett started all this approximately 50 years ago when he, very, he wrote the paper very aptly titled The Ankle Blowout Syndrome because he was able to associate incompetent perforators and the jets of flow with calf muscle contraction impinging on the skin and basically causing a blowout type syndrome which led to degradation of the skin and ultimate ulceration particularly in this gator zone as shown here. The problem in chronic venous insufficiency in cases like this is a combination of the gravitational reflux we saw with primary varicose veins as well as failed perforator valves. Normally these perforator veins tend to be fairly small. You don't see them on a normal resting venous examination as a rule and they all have valves which are designed to allow venous emptying from the superficial into the deep system. When these valves break down and you have perforator valvular incompetence, that allows flow from the deep out into the superficial system, and this is what leads to the chronic problems in the post-thrombotic syndrome and ulceration. With color Doppler, it's easy to identify you see the deep system, you see the superficial system, and color-coded red, which means in this case flow is towards the probe or from the deep into the superficial system, you're able to readily identify incompetence of the perforator vein and breakdown of the valve that's normally present. There is some debate still ongoing about the importance of perforator vein incompetence. Uh, in the mid-1980s, a couple well-noted Clinicians in the United Kingdom both wrote papers about the clinical importance, one claiming they were very important, and Dr. Bernard saying they really had no clinical importance. Uh, that controversy actually is still ongoing. The debate still rages, and it really becomes a function of individualizing each patient and looking at the underlying cause of their chronic venous insufficiency and what are the clinical changes associated with that. Duplex ultrasound is an excellent means of identifying the location of perforating veins. We can measure their lumen diameter or caliber, and we can readily assess with color Doppler imaging their valvular competence. It is interesting to note a number of studies have shown that if you look at primary varicose veins in these patients with chronic venous insufficiency, approximately 20% of the limbs in these patients do in fact have incompetent perforating veins. If you look at the lumen size, it can give you insight into whether or not the valve is going to be competent. Pretty much any perforating vein that is less than two millimeters in lumen diameter is going to be competent, and anything greater than three and a half millimeters is probably going to be incompetent. Between two and 3.5 millimeters in lumen diameter is the transition zone, but with color Doppler imaging, these are large enough to readily identify and establish valvular competence with simple augmentation maneuvers of the calf. This is an example of a very large dilated perforating vein, the deep venous system, the superficial system, measuring the lumen diameter where it crosses the fascial plane. This is where the valve normally exists and looking at the diameter at that point, you can classify it fairly readily just based on anatomic considerations into likely competent, likely incompetent, or transition region.